Hi, good afternoon. I'm glad to we were able to join you today. Uh, my name is Matt Mangriotis. I'm with Cambium Networks. And today, uh, welcome to this breakout session as part of that uh, WISP virtual summit that everyone's excited about. Uh, today, we're talking here about CBRS, uh, pretty much the status of where we're at. I'll give you a quick overview of the Cambium side of things. And I have a special guest here, uh, the CEO and founder of Webformix, uh, Eric Azrelik. And we'll be talking to him towards the end, uh, asking him about his experience with CBRS as well. So without further ado. So why does anyone care about CBRS? Well, CBRS, the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, uh, it's, it's a band of radio um, transmission that is in the United States and it's a dynamic spectrum sharing model. Um, really, this can be applied anywhere. Uh, this is kind of the first of its kind though in the world and they're, they're dubbing it the innovation band. It's pretty in, impressive what they've done with it, uh, but it is pretty complex. It allows a tiered approach to best utilize that spectrum and share it among different classes of users. Uh, the nice thing is that it won't uh, hold spectrum. It's not a spectrum warehouse type of model, um, but that shared use, it will also help mitigate that by measuring and, and uh, maintaining a database of the interference caused by radios that are operating in that spectrum. So I do mention it is complex. And so there's some pros and some cons to using it. Uh, on the pro side, it's three gig. It's 3.65, 3.55 to 3.7. We'll talk a little bit more specific about that. Um, but it is lower frequency than five. So it has some better penetration characteristics. And because it's shared and managed, uh, they are allowing, they meaning the uh, FCC are allowing he higher power limits uh, than was previously allowed in that band. It is actively managed and that will get better over time. Uh, it's in its initial phases right now. So they're not managing as much as um, kind of maintaining the database, but in the future, they're gonna be working on uh, coexistence uh, managers that will help uh, to manage this in a, in a better way. It protects the incumbents that are in there. Um, those that are grandfathered in as well as some of the higher um, incumbent users like the Department of Defense and the radar and the fixed satellite stations around the United States. Uh, and there's this option to buy a priority license, the PAL. Uh, we'll touch on that in a little bit as well. Uh, some of this, there are cons to using it as well. Um, and the spectrum sharing has a cost associated with it. In order to be part of this database, you have to pay and, and it's a monthly fee per device. Um, there's a lot of hype around this thing. Uh, I just released a blog uh, last week where we discuss kind of the use cases, the, the various use cases that are being talked about in the in industry. And several of them are very innovative and very cool. Uh, and a little further out, this fixed wireless use case that we focus on today is really the primary use case. And uh, I, I worry a little bit that the hype of these other use cases might uh, cause congestion or cause uh, the spectrum to be used up more quickly. Uh, but fixed wireless cert certainly is leading the way in terms of use case. Um, the equipment in this band is slightly more expensive, uh, and that's a hardware function of the power amplifiers and the filtering that's used. Uh, it's just typically more expensive uh, because it's less prevalent uh, than the unlicensed bands. When you talk about CBRS, the first thing that most people talk about is LTE. Um, while LTE as a standard is popular, um, the 450 platform that we've designed, which is a purpose-built software-defined radio platform, that platform is well suited for CBRS and this band specifically. And we find that there's no parallel, there's no equal uh, to this uh, in terms of performance. So we, a lot of folks talk about LTE in this band. We have an alternate alternative to LTE in this band. And the rules and requirements are very complex and we'll, we'll get into some of the details around that. So as success is demonstrated in CBRS in the US, we will see this adopted in other places around the world, maybe other bands, even in the US. So uh, that's kind of why you should at least pay attention to what's going on uh, while this is happening. So uh, this chart, most people have probably seen already, but it's worth noting, uh, summarizing the band for you. Uh, in the past, on the left side there, the opportunity was a 50 megahertz chunk of spectrum. Uh, it was called the 365 band, part 90. And now we have 150 megahertz of spectrum to use. So they added another 100 uh, in the CBRS. Um, again, it's flexible tiered use of the spectrum, meaning the incumbents have priority. 
the ultimate priority, and that's the Department of Defense and the satellite earth stations. Um, priority access licenses have priority over the rest of the band, uh, rest of the users of the band, which were, would be the general authorized access users. And so uh, it is a tiered flexible use system uh, with multiple varying levels of use. Um, and it's 355 to 37, they're calling it TD LTE band 48. So when you do use LTE, if it supports band 48, you know that's this band that they're talking about. In terms of a little bit deeper dive in the frequency, the priority access licenses, the black bar, it is up to seven 10 megahertz channels in any given county. Uh, it's county based. The auction is taking place right now. Uh, it started last week and it is a, a 10 year term. Any entity can own up to four of those 10 megahertz licenses. There is a minimum bid and we'll see how those that bidding uh, ends up. Um, it's ongoing uh, right now. And uh, as I mentioned, and I'll mention later, if you're if you are a bidder in this PAL auction, good luck, and I hope I hope you uh, are successful in obtaining some of the licenses. Um, that said, only seven of those of that hundred megahertz, seventy of that hundred megahertz of the lower one hundred, uh, will be auctioned off. So that means at least three channels or three ten megahertz channels, thirty megahertz, will be available always for GAA in any given county. Uh, plus the upper fifty, once those incumbent uh, grandfathered wireless folks go away, uh, which most are expected to expire on October 17, uh, 2020. And we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Uh, once those expire, uh, then there will be at least 80, so 50 plus 30, at least 80 megahertz of spectrum available for CBRS to GAA users. So what's Cambium Networks doing with this band? Um, our strategy is to be the equipment provider and what we're doing is we're partnering with each of the major three SAS vendors or SAS administrators out there so the equipment needs to talk to a SAS uh, database a SAS administrator in order to stay on air get on air and stay on air meaning if we lose communication and we've seen it happen a couple times in the infancy here we've, we've run into a couple of road bumps and be the first to admit we're working through some things um, but we are working with the major three uh, providers, uh, Federated Wireless, Google, and we're bringing Comscope on board as we speak. Uh, we have a couple customers doing beta testing with that right now, and we'll be fully on board with Comscope within a couple of weeks here. Um, when Cambium equipment is used in CBRS, the end user is entering into a direct business relationship. So you can choose any of the SASs you want, but the relationship is with Cambium. And we manage that transmission path of the, of the data, as well as the business uh, relationship, meaning we charge a specific amount of money for the, that radio uh, per month. And it's the SMs that, that are charged. All of our three gigahertz 450 radios are capable of operating in either part 90 or part 96. So part 90 isn't gonna be so important any longer um, come October, uh, but they will all migrate easily uh, to part 96 if you are an existing customer and you can start in part 96 if you'd like, uh, if you're a new customer. So that's a great, a great story that we've been able to fully utilize the entire platform, uh, whether it's the original 450, 450i, or 450b or m uh, in uh, part 96. So I mentioned the PALs. Uh, I just want to touch on that just a bit here. The PALs allow a user to be allocated a 10 megahertz channel, which has priority over GAAs. The list of bidders has been published. Uh, the auction has begun. So there's a lot of folks like you, hopefully, uh, that are on the list of and, and are bidding, and maybe you're doing so right now. Uh, but so are some of the bigger guys, the AT&T, Frontier, US Cellular, some of the cable companies. They're all bidding for the same spectrum, and it depends where you are, whether this is going to be feasible for you or not. Uh, and we'll see where it ends up in terms of the dollars and cents. Uh, the latest estimate that I saw said the FCC or the government stands to make something on the order of $8 billion or um, in this auction. So it's an interesting thing. We'll see how it all shakes out. Um, and I did a quick look at the license database that's available publicly. Uh, there are 2,800 NN licenses with part 90 licenses that were issued. Uh, about 650 of those expired already. Um, 
and about another 850 are going to expire in October. So it's a very interesting uh, dynamic here that things are really rapidly shifting. Uh, there are a number of them, you may notice, that will extend out uh, past that date, but there are a couple caveats, and we'll talk about that as well. So moving to the equipment that's being used in CBRS, our, as I mentioned, our 450 platform is being used, and the flagship access point for this is the CN Medusa, or 450M, uh, product. This product contains our leading edge uh, technical innovations. It, it has massive multi-user MIMO. Uh, that means that it's able to talk to up to four subscribers simultaneously. It's an eight by eight system. This means you can take best advantage of whatever spectrum you have available. In a Whether it's in a 10 megahertz, 20, 30, or 40 megahertz channel, you can utilize that spectrum to the best of its ability. And in the largest channel, we, we've seen uh, data rates up at 700 megabits per second. It's, it's a very impressive system. It can meet just about the, the highest EIRP allowed uh, in the band. It does really well with interference mitigation due to the beamforming capabilities in both the uplink and the downlink. Uh, further to that, it can provide enhanced capacity in the uplink due to the beamforming and multi-user MIMO capabilities in the uplink as well as downlink. So it's a very impressive system. And it's all self-contained in that one uh, one package. It's not small, it's not inexpensive, but it is very powerful, very high capacity, very scalable. And we'll get into some details around this product uh, as, as Eric talks about his network, I'm sure. Uh, we do have a solution paper that discusses all the technical aspects and how they work. Uh, and this paper is available on our website and it continually gets updated with uh, the latest uh, innovations. Being a FPGA designed uh, purpose-built software defined radio, we continually make improvements on the technology. The latest subscriber module as well has been released and that is the three gigahertz 450B subscriber. It very much looks like the five gig version, the five gig variant of this. It's an integrated parabolic dish and it uh, has very high gain and it, it actually very high transmit power as well. So this product can also reach near to the uh, EIRP limits allowed in the band, which makes for a very good robust connection uh, in CBRS. It has very high packets per second uh, processing power. It's approved for use in CBRS and it is the de facto standard that most folks are, are migrating to now uh, to use in the CBRS band. We've made some improvements even over the five gigahertz version uh, by moving the LEDs to somewhere that it's a, a more visible um, while you're installing it. Um, so it's easier to install. And uh, we've had very good reports. This just came out in March. We've uh, sold thousands of them, but they're just kind of making their way through the, uh, the supply chain and getting out to the customers uh, as we speak here. So if you'd like to learn more, uh, come to the micro site. Uh, we have cambiumnetworks.com slash CBRS, very easy to get to, but there's a ton of information on there. We've written a, a frequently asked questions document. We have links to the community, some news uh, around CBRS. There's, uh, as I mentioned, wrote a blog recently about the use cases around CBRS. Um, it's a really important topic uh, to at least be aware of. And if you'd like to learn more, feel free to, to visit the site. In terms of timelines, there are things happening in this in this band. Uh, I mentioned already that they moved the the date of the end of part 90. Um, we started operations in commercially in April, and there are really tens of thousands of subscriber modules already taking advantage of that additional spectrum and higher power allowed in CBRS. It's uh, most folks are having great experience with CBRS. As I mentioned, there are some growing pains. There are some learnings that we're we're uncovering as we go. And when they do implement, when the they, meaning the SAS administrators, do implement this coexistence module and method, uh, things will be learning about uh, again. Uh, but it's exciting because now we're managing the spectrum rather than just putting out uh, whoever wants to be in it. I mentioned that waiver uh, extension had been granted uh, back in April. They, in late March, actually, they announced that we're moving the deadline to October from April. Uh, it's great, but it, it creates some problems uh, in that, number one, the SAS does not know about the Part 90 radios. So anything that's operating in Part 90, the SAS isn't aware of because it's not entered into the database. It's not managed in any way. Um, so there could be interference 
causes or, or causes of interference that the SAS isn't aware of that are maybe in uh, affecting operation of the devices that are supposed to be in there in Part 96. So could be a little confusing for folks uh, in that area. GPWZ, the Grandfather Protectus Protected Wireless Zones, are actually hampering the use of Part 96, even for the operator who owns that GPWZ. So what that does is actually block off the, that upper 50 megahertz of spectrum. And regardless of whether you own it or not, as long as it's registered in the database, the SAS won't grant Part 96 users any access to that 50 megahertz of spectrum in whatever area that GT, GPWZ exists. So it's causing a bit of problems uh, for those guys. And there are ways to get around that. Uh, you can re actually revoke those uh, GPWZs in specific areas. And uh, we've been working with the SASs to do that for some customers. A couple of really important notes uh, that I'm not sure everyone's aware of, but I want to make sure that folks who are watching this are, uh, understand. They did move the deadline but they are not granting additional Part 90 sites. You cannot put out new Part 90 sites legally. Uh, the FCC will not approve them. Um, so no new locations can be registered under Part 90. That's number one. Number two, check your license, check your NN license. M most of them expire on April 17, 2020, or really before the end of the year, but there are a big chunk, about a thousand of them, that will stay active. But if that license was issued or renewed after January 8th, 2013, Part 90 ends on October 17th, 2020. That's the rule. That's what it says in the statement uh, when they issued that waiver. So best to check your license. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not recommending anything legally. I'm just asking that you check your license to make sure that you're operating within the regulations. And then again, again just to mention the PAL auctions, they began last week. Uh, and they ex they're expected to last a few weeks uh, into August. And if you're bidding, uh, best of luck to you. Hope you uh, obtain what you want. And now the fun part of the presentation, you've been listening for a little while. Uh, I understand that during this virtual WISP summit, there's the challenge codes that pop up here and there. And hopefully that means you're, you're listening for them. It's Cambium CBRS. So there's your challenge code. I'll leave it on the screen for just a few more seconds so folks can see it. Um, and good luck with whatever prizes you may win because of this challenge code. With that, I'd like to open the floor and uh, actually do a little question and answer session uh, with our special guest. Eric's been sitting patiently uh, watching me talk for a few minutes now. Um, but I'd like to invite Eric uh, to answer a few questions. So Eric's from Webformix, as I mentioned. And he's been using CBRS for a little while now. And I guess, Eric, I'd like to ask you, what has been your experience with CBRS so far? Hey, thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks for having me on. And thanks for uh, pre seeing for hosting this event. Um, yeah, I'd love, like to answer a few questions. I think I'd like to start off with uh, three points. Um, just right off the bat, as a uh, longtime Cambium user and one of the first. Uh, wireless ISPs that uh, tapped use of the 365 band back when it first came out. Um, one of the things that has impressed me with Cambium uh, is the the longevity uh, of the 450 equipment in terms of um, how long uh, I've been able to keep it out in the field and generate revenue from it. And uh, it was a very happy very happy surprise that all of all of the equipment, even the oldest equipment, uh, would be a CBRS certified, and uh, I'm sure that was a, a challenge, um, no easy feat, especially you know not having the foresight back in the beginning to to you know know all the rules and regulations around CBRS and have your all your legacy equipment uh, uh, adhere to that. So I have to give props to Cambium for that. They're one of, um, I think they're, they're the only manufacturer that I've heard of where all of the, uh, all of the equipment uh, is certified from CBRS and it has been for some time too, which has given me uh, a leg up in terms of testing, in terms of trying to um, you know, get my bearings of, with CBRS and giving me the time to comfortably transition over from 365 over to CBRS. Uh, so that's been that's been a huge uh, benefit. The second item I want to point on is uh, is that 
there's, as Matt mentioned, um, there are these 10 megahertz blocks. In a worst case kind of scenario, um, maybe you're in a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, competitive area and all these blocks, uh, you know, all the pals are taken. There's very few blocks, if any, to choose from. Um, I think that the PMP 450M gives the best bang for the buck. If you're limited in terms of channel width, um, that's going to be your best option, hands down, uh, for uh, the highest density AP and best overall throughput. We did some tests where we purposefully uh, took a, a loaded up PMP 450i sector with like 50 or 60 subscribers on it that was running on a 20 meter channel. Um, and it was doing, you know, it was doing okay. It was getting a little, a little high in terms of utilization. And we swapped it out with a PMP 450M. And then we purposefully dropped from a 20 megahertz carrier down to a 10 megahertz carrier to see if we could still support that same number of subscribers on a 10 megahertz carrier and uh, still get, you know, have speed tiers up to, you know, 30, uh, 30 or so megabits, um, and it worked great. Uh, and there was additional headroom to grow. Um, and then coupled with uh, pre-seam, uh, we used pre-seam to help kind of smooth out the gaps in that as well. So again, kind of a dynamic duo is um, 450 uh, with smaller channel widths and pre-seam. Like if you're, if you're stuck with that situation, then that combination is uh, is a great Great help. Cool. Um, the last demo I wanted to talk on was the uh, EIRP. Um, Cambium has one of the highest uh, EIRPs granted across the board um, for some of the manufacturers I've investigated. And we've done quite a bit of testing um, where we have uh, a, a legacy LTE network um, and we've done side-by-side -side testing with LTE um, very similar EIRP and channel width and other conditions versus PMP 450M paired with the 450B high gain client. And we found that in pretty much every circumstance, every situation near a non-line of sight, uh, that the 450M plus 450B combination um, beat the LTE setup in terms of uh, overall performance um, and, and throughput. Um, so that gave us the confidence that we needed to start actually migrating some of our LTE over to PMP 450. Uh, so anyway, those are the three points that are the most val of value to me as an operator and uh, definitely appreciate Cambium for bringing those things, uh, those tools to my business. Thanks a lot for that. I, uh, you hit a lot of the questions I was going to ask you already, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> uh, I guess a couple more. Are you able to utilize, so we opened up this lower 100 megahertz. When you go and register a new site uh, with the SAS, are you able to ask for uh, areas in that lower 100 and are you granted them? Is it How's that process going for you? I guess stepping back a bit, how's the whole process of obtaining the CPI information, which, you know, is a little bit more complex. Um, is, is that process going well? Is it smooth? Is there hiccups in that process? Uh, have you had to wait for CPAS, which is the SASs that communicate with each other? Have you had to wait for that in a lot of cases? Or are you getting grants right away? Kind of give your experience a little bit about the operational aspects of getting onboarded to CBRS. Uh, we've been very fortunate in that most grants that we've been requesting and um, uh, EIRPs have been granted without issue actually very quickly. Um, part of that might just be that there aren't a lot of other uh, operators using CBRS. We're kind of uh, on the, the forefront in our community and to just start to be using that. Clear, you're you're inland in Oregon, right? You're not by the coast, so you're not subject to the exclusion zones and potential what they call dynamic protection areas right correct yeah we're located in central oregon uh east of the cascades so yeah we don't have to worry about that um, but yeah we we haven't had very many issues with that as far as the the process to get 
get things on board and authorized, uh, it's been pretty easy. Um, I don't have a ton of experience with, with other uh, uh, CBRS equipment manufacturers. I have investigated in a few of them. And so far, at least um, on the nose, the, the uh, Cambium system seems to be the most uh, put together at the moment in terms of functionality and ease of use. Um, we are waiting a little bit on some revisions to CN Maestro and to the uh, spreadsheet. Um, Cambium distributes a, uh, a spreadsheet to make things very easy for you to enter in your APs and your subscriber modules. And it actually does some calculations for you um, to, to figure out the you know up and down tilt and the azimuth of radios and whatnot. So that's very handy. Uh, but we're waiting on a few tweaks to that spreadsheet and a few additions to CM Maestro that should make things even easier to do like mass imports. Yeah, and, I should, uh, we have, I we should have mention, about a thousand. Uh, sorry, before you go on, I should mention that uh, version 2.4.1 of CN Maestro is imminent. It's coming out very soon, and that includes updates to that spreadsheet, and I believe the ones you're looking for, uh, including compatibility with LibreOffice and uh, OpenOffice, um, the Google Office Sheets. Uh, so that I think those are some of the things that a lot of customers have asked about. Uh, can you just, you know, can you be compatible with more than just Microsoft Excel? And I think that is coming in the next revision. So just be aware of that. So go on. Sorry to interrupt you. Um. Yeah. So yeah, when you have, uh, we have about a thousand three six five radios that we need to transition over into CBRS space. Um, having these tools again, like a, a spreadsheet that's accessible to multiple um, applications, and having CN Maestro dialed in um, is going to make it just that much easier for us to to complete our transition before the October deadline. And we're confident that we can do that. Great. Have you run into any issues like that were kind of required support from Cambium, from the SaaS vendor? Uh, have you run into anything where you kind of needed to contact us and get support on it? Aside from things that we, you know, we know about like the office compatibility um, or the tweaks to the spreadsheet. And then I guess the follow on question is how has that support been? Are you, are you comfortable with support that you've been given from Cambium and others uh, involved? So we we haven't had really many, uh, if any, support issues. Mostly just kind of questions, um, like how does this work? You know, uh, how do we import this, and and so on and so forth. We haven't had any SaaS questions whatsoever. Um, we found both uh, Cambium's forums. Uh, they have a, a dedicated CBRS forum um, that you can ask questions, and other operators can help out and answer questions and share experiences. Um, we we haven't had to actually raise a ticket yet. The only ticket we've had to raise was from changing from one SaaS to another. And that was a pretty painless process. We were changing, we just wanted to try out Federated. We were on Google. And I think from start to finish to, you know, from one end to the other, it took like about a week, I think, to change from one SaaS to the other. And that so, was going to be another famous. question is, who are you using? So as Cambium, we support the big three, uh, and we want to be somewhat neutral in that approach, uh, meaning we leave that up to the end users to decide. But I guess from your point of view, do you have a pre strong preference? Are you using one versus another for any reason? And, and I'll be uh, upfront, our pricing from Cambium standpoint is the same regardless of which SaaS you choose. Um, so from your standpoint, did you pick one, then move to the other, or are you, you know, are you going to stick with them? Uh, moving them is not transparent. It's not super easy. It does take some involvement, and, and there are service interruptions in doing so. But you can if you need to. And so I guess I, I'd like to understand your choice, and if there's any strong reasons or opinions why. We chose Federated just because. We thought that they were a little farther along in the coordination process and um, maybe it's just anecdotal but it just seems to me that uh, other operators were using federated as well um, 
Google does have some really interesting tools at their disposal. Um, I haven't tried out any of those yet, uh, but Federated so far has been fine. We haven't had any issues. And I also like some of the news that I, I hear about Federated um, coming up with some more advanced features um, down, down the road here uh, that can help with uh, coordination. Great. So that's, that's why we're using it. I'm not sure if we change again in the future, but we're happy for the moment. Great, thanks, I appreciate that. Um, one more quick one, um, and it's related, I guess, to the COVID crisis. Has that affected your business? Is, has that impacted the ability to get on CBRS? Has it impacted, has it accelerated the use of that spectrum? Or is that not a non-factor for you? Uh, how has that affected your business? I guess I'm curious. Um, well, COVID has definitely uh, affected it in, in a positive way in terms of we've uh, seen a huge increase in new subscribers and people upgrading their, their bandwidth plans. Um, you know, obviously more people are working from home, uh, studying from home, and just trying to stay safe inside and using more data because of it. So yes, it, it is have, it's had a positive effect. And of course, with those increases in usage, um, we've, we've really liked the ability to basically uh, dynamically step up if needed. Um, you know, we can start off at a, at a 10 megahertz carrier and, and easily move up to a 20 megahertz carrier if needed. We haven't had any issues getting grants for larger channel widths, at least at the moment. So uh, in a pinch, uh, it's definitely helped um, quickly provide uh, bandwidth where needed. Great. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to share or you want to call that a wrap? Um, I think that's, that's good, but uh, we look forward to answering any questions that you all may have. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, thanks very much, Eric. I appreciate it, too, uh, that you're here with us. Um, as far as resources go, I mentioned a few different um, resources on our website. Here's a couple more. Uh, certainly come to the website, come to the forums. You can ask away there. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, right now, you can uh, ask questions via the text box. Thanks for uh, joining this breakout session. And in the group discussions tab, I believe, uh, you'll see this breakout session listed and a button that says let's chat and you can go in there and start typing in your chats and we'll be online right here uh, able to answer questions for the next few minutes if you have any. Uh, thanks again for joining and we'll talk to you soon.